Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just reminded that Lord, we who were lawbreakers and thieves, who were in rebellion against you, who loved our sin, who were enslaved to our sin, and then your grace came and made us alive in your Son, and we are here tonight to join with one another and hear from you as you speak through your word and to sing to you. Um, Lord, I pray, Lord, as we spend our time in the Psalms this evening, that as you place them as a songbook for your people, Lord, that our own hearts would be prepared to worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are week four of working our way through at least the, the earlier parts of the book of Psalms. And tonight we'll be in Psalm 4. Uh, my, my wife and I have had the, uh, had the privilege of serving in the two-year-olds class here at Grace Bible Church for the better part of a decade. And one of the joys of serving that age is you just get to see how much they grow in the 12 months that they're in your class. You get to know these children you get to know what makes them laugh. You get to know what makes individual kids more likely to cry. You maybe you learn their favorite toys, snack, who they can sit next to. But the most humbling part of serving in that class is when you bump into those same children in the hall a couple years later, you say hello to them, and what do they do? They look up at you as if they've never seen you in their lives. <laughs> Maybe you can relate, you know the feeling. But occasionally, one of them miraculously remembers something that you said or did from that class. And one, one parent came up to me a couple years later and said how their children still remember the silly song I taught their children about the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not going to sing it for you, but the line they remembered was, the fruit of the Spirit is not a jalapeno. So if you want to be a jalapeno, you might as well hear it because you can't be a fruit of the Spirit. Because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's what they remembered. And so why do I tell you that story? Well, the, the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5 is foundational for the Christian life. We teach it to children. But as adults, it's foundational for us. It's one of, really, still one of the best ways to take our own spiritual pulse, to gauge our spiritual maturity. Does my life demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? In that moment, was my response characterized by the fruit of the Spirit or the deeds of the flesh? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. It goes on. And tonight, as we look to prepare to feast on Psalm 4, we'll look at two of those manifestations of the Spirit, joy and peace. So is the Spirit at work in you? Do you see joy and peace in your life? Well, how does the unexpected, the unwanted, the unplanned, the difficult, the hard thing, how do those things affect your joy? How do they affect your peace? When difficulty comes into your life, do you find yourself lying in bed at night thinking about your problems and the worries of tomorrow? Maybe you find your joy ebbing and flowing based upon the level of conflict currently in your life. Well, if that's the case, Psalm 4 is for you. Would you describe your life as peaceful? Maybe you look at the circumstances of your life, the hardships, the difficulties, the seemingly insurmountable battles, maybe parenting difficulties, financial pressure, strained relationships, maybe sin and slander against you. Maybe you look at these things and think to yourself, how can I find peace here? Well, then Psalm 4 is for you. In Psalm 4, David is again experiencing, as in Psalm 3, distressed, Opposed by the ungodly, surrounded by falsehood and mocking. And yet, at the conclusion of the psalm, he cries out to the Lord. And let's look closely, briefly, at verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 4. In the midst of his distress, David 
cries out, you have put gladness or joy in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Yahweh, make me to abide in safety. The title of this sermon is Joy and Peace Under Pressure. David couldn't do much about the war that was around him, but he could do something about the war that was within him. He did not want to lie in bed and worry, so he committed himself and his situation to the Lord. And that may sound trite, but to those who lie awake at night because of real anxiety, real relief requires real answers. So let's read from Psalm 4 this evening. For the choir director, with stringed instruments, a psalm of David, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my glory become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and seek falsehood? But know that Yahweh has set apart the Holy One for himself. Yahweh hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Ponder in your heart upon your head, upon your bed, and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in Yahweh. Many are saying, who will show us good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Yahweh. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Yahweh, make me to abide in safety. In Psalm 4, David doesn't supply any historical context for us in his heading. We have no certain way of knowing the background, although there are a variety of similarities between Psalm 3 and 4, but... Psalm 4 could also depict many different events in David's life. So it's best to content ourselves as we look at it this evening uh, with just seeing Psalm 4 as addressing trouble in general. And this means that Psalm 4 is especially applicable to any trouble or distress in our own lives. Any trouble or distress that might threaten our joy and our peace. So look again at David's heading for the choir director This psalm is is given to the choir director for the choir. It's for the the singing of the congregation. And while, as we just read, Psalm 4 contains prayers to the Lord and it seemingly contains words directed to David's adversaries, it was composed for the people of God to worship. So first and foremost, it's a message for the congregation, uh, the people of God. And it contains truths that must be embraced and believed to fuel both worship and faith in the Lord. Also take note that Psalm 4, still in our heading, is to be sung with stringed instruments. It isn't to be played on trumpets or on flutes or on tambourines. Uh, that, That would be appropriate if this was a festive song. No, but it's to be played on strings, harps, and lyres. So the tone of this psalm is more like a lament a cry to God. And it is in this cry to the Lord in Psalm 4 that David shows us three necessary pursuits in the fight for joy and peace in times of distress. Three necessary pursuits in the fight for joy and peace in times of distress. The first of those is found in verses 1 and 2. Cast yourself upon God and his character. So let's read verses 1 and 2 again. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer, sons of men. How long will my glory become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and seek falsehood? Verse 1 is a plea to God for help. Answer me, be gracious to me, hear my prayer. And then in verse 2, we see David in expression of exasperation. How long? How long? He cries. These are the cries of a desperate man. He's at the end of himself. He has nowhere to turn, so he turns to God. 
Have you, have you ever been in that place before? It's a hard place to be, um, but it's a good place to be. And when the pressures and problems of life just seem too large for us, it's good to cry, good to, cry to the Lord for help. And that's what David did. And, and the first way we want to look at that David cast himself upon God's character and that we can cast ourselves upon God's character is to entrust yourself to God's justice. Entrust yourself to God's justice. Notice when he says in verse 1, O God of my righteousness. On this side of the cross, when we see the word righteousness, we often just run to the fact that he must be talking about justification. But in this verse, David is most likely referring to God as the source of what is right or righteous. God is the one who will right all wrongs, who will deliver justice to God's people and to David specifically. God will be the one who vindicates David. David recognized justice belongs to the Lord. David's joy and peace weren't to be had in David righting the wrongs against him or getting even. Instead, David could rest in the truth that God was the one who would render justice for him. David, the rightful king who was to administer justice in the kingdom, temporarily had had his power stripped away from him in the past. And and if that's the potential circumstance of this psalm, uh, David could find joy and peace, not in a change of circumstance, not in a getting back his power and giving his adversaries what they deserved, but in asking the Lord for relief and then in waiting on him as the final source of justice. Another way to cast yourself upon God and his character is secondly, to remember God's kindness shown to you. Look back at verse 1. You have relieved me in my distress. This could literally be rendered in a tight place you have made room for me. This evokes the picture of David in a time, David in times past where his enemies were crowding him out or the pressures were squeezing him from all sides. He had no room, and what did God do for David in a tight place? You made room for me. God gave him relief in his distress, relieving the pressure by making room. And time after time, David could look back to God answering his prayer. God had shown kindness to him over and over again with Saul, with Absalom, with Shimei, with Ziklag, over and over again, God rescued him and gave him relief. So now David, finding himself in similar distress, again in a tight place, remembers God's past kindness and again asks God to answer his prayer. Perhaps he's looking back to times when the Lord heard his cry, like when he was facing Goliath or when Absalom revolted. When you are in distress, do you ever wonder if prayer will do any good? Has has God ever answered prayer for you before? Has God ever shown you kindness? Maybe even when you didn't pray for it. Reflect about how God has shown kindness to you in the past. That's what David does. He looks to God's track record of kindness in his past and trusts him in the present. Ask him, And trust yourself to him and his wisdom. Remember his goodness in forgiving your sin in the past and reconciling you to Christ. Next, as we cast ourselves upon God and his character, humble yourself before our gracious and compassionate God. Well, have you ever doubted that God hears your prayer? Maybe you haven't doubted that he hears, but maybe you've doubted that you deserve the answer that you're seeking. Maybe God won't answer because I don't deserve it. Well, the truth is you don't. We don't. We don't deserve God's kindness. We don't deserve to be free from injustice in this world. David didn't plead his own merit. What does he appeal to? God's graciousness. He knows he doesn't deserve what he asks. He he himself has sinned against the Lord gravely. But he cast himself upon the Lord, seeking favor that he doesn't deserve. Because that's who God is. He's gracious. 
He is full of compassion. He treats his children better than we deserve. He's gracious and he dispenses undeserved favor for those who know him. So don't let your feelings of unworthiness and your distress keep you from turning to the Lord. Turn to him. Recognize your unworthiness. Cast yourself upon his grace and his mercy. Next, as you cast yourself upon God and his character, resolve to wait on the Lord in his sovereign timing. Read verse two again. Oh, sons of men, how long will my glory become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and seek falsehood? And this section is addressed to sons of men. And this is probably a reference to leaders, those in authority, whoever was responsible for David's present affliction. And David seems to be asking questions of them who would slander him. David's honor and glory given by God were being turned into shame. And we don't know the exact instance this calls to mind in David's life. Perhaps this calls to mind criticism from men like Shimei in 2 Samuel 16, 7. And this is where David flees Absalom and Shimei curses David. And he comes to David and says, Get out, you man of bloodshed and vile fellow. Yahweh has returned upon you all of the bloodshed of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And Yahweh has given the kingdom into your hand, into the hand of your son Absalom, and behold, you're taken in your own evil, for you're a man of bloodshed. Well, we remember it was actually God who removed the kingdom from Saul and appointed David as king. God chose to bestow honor on David and his line. But his adversaries uh, accused David of actually rising to the throne by subversion, by evil, and by bloodshed. David, you took the rightful place of Saul. His critics, long after Saul's death, see Absalom's possession of the throne as vindication for all of their slander. See the bad things happening to David? Everything we said about him in the past was right. His honor, David's honor, God's elevation of him to king and forerunner of the Messiah had become a reproach. So David cries in the, and in the midst of his prayer to the Lord says, how long will you love what is worthless and false? This people cling to vanity and lies and they mean to take him down. And David feels the pain and anguish. And this is a cry that it would all stop. And these questions to his adversaries in verse 2 uh, may not be depictions of specific conversations. Um, they might be, as, for example, in the, in the case of his conversation with Shimei. We don't know what was said. But as they are in the midst of prayer, these seem to be just the cries of desperation as he pours himself, his heart out to God and he contemplates the present affliction of those around him. And he cries out, oh, sons of men, how long? In your pain and trouble, God might seem far off. It might seem like your trials will never end. But God's in control. And if he is in control, he is worthy of being trusted. So we trust God and we resolve to wait on his sovereign timing. He's in control. He's in control of the calendar. He's in control of the time clock and we trust him. At the end of the verse 2, notice the Selah, which calls for a pause or interlude. And in verse 2, we see the desperation of David, how long? And then comes the Selah, where we should pause and we should feel David's long wait in that pause as he works to bring himself to a point where he's entrusting himself to the Lord's timing. But after the long wait, David again speaks, and we see a transition in David. No longer do we see his desperation. Instead, we see him comforted by truth. It's as if 
David emerges after this pause as a different David, a comforted David. And this leads to one additional way to cast yourself upon the character of God. Be comforted by the Lord's special purpose for the saints. Look at verse 3. But know that Yahweh has set apart the Holy One for himself. Yahweh hears when I call to him. Again, this is all in the context of prayer, but in the vocabulary and the language and the grammar, he's addressing somebody. And is it the sons of men or is it the congregation of the saints? If it's the same sons of men that are in view, then verse 3 is more of a threat and a warning against them. And if it's addressed to the saints, to the godly man or the holy one, then this is a verse of encouragement. And it's difficult to be certain here, but knowing this psalm is for corporate worship, it might be best to understand this is David's words to the congregation who may find themselves in similar distress. So David's message to the congregation and his message to us is this. No matter what pressure you're under, no matter what adversaries you face, you can trust the Lord. Because Yahweh has set apart the godly one or holy one for himself to show him kindness and mercy and to hear his prayer, to hear our prayers. While the wicked love worthlessness and seek falsehood, God has set apart for himself those who love him and seek truth. Well, Yahweh, David concludes in verse 3, Yahweh hears when I call to him. David isn't begging anymore for God to hear him. He, he knows that God hears him. God is committed to his children. He knows our suffering and he hears our prayers. And David is comforted by this. And we ought to be comforted. If you're here tonight, has the Lord set you apart? Is your hope and trust in the Lord? Have you come to faith in Jesus as the only way to God? You must. Are you trusting him in the day of your trial? This is David's point. Yes, I'm in anguish. Yes, great trials are in my life, but I know these things have not escaped the notice of my God. I know that I'm one of his, that he's set apart, and I'll trust him through these difficult times. So God's answer may be slow, and he may not be doing what you and I desire that he does, but we can trust his answer. It may not be exactly what we want. Pour out your heart to the Lord. Come boldly before him. Let your request be known to him. But in the end, we trust his ways, and that's what the godly one does. That's how the godly one can actually have joy and peace even when their circumstances don't change. The writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 5, you can just listen. Jesus, in the days of his flesh, offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. God's will brought Jesus to the cross. It wasn't easy for Jesus, but Jesus followed his father. Even in that dark valley and in his loud cries to the one who is able to save him from that death, God heard him. God heard the prayer of the Holy One, the set apart one of his son. And do you know what happened next after God heard his prayer? God didn't deliver him from the trial. But Jesus entrusted himself to his father, even when it was difficult, even when his prayer wasn't answered as he desired as a man. Yet God still heard the prayer and God still hears our prayers. And Jesus is our great example in this. His trust in the father didn't waver. And we too can trust the Lord, confident that he hears us. He loves us and will do what is best for us. And we can find joy in that, and we can find peace in that. Well, the second necessary pursuit in the fight for, for joy and peace in times of distress is 
we see in verses 4 and 5, pursue godly conduct. Pursue godly conduct. In verses 4 and 5, David shows us that the path to joy and the path to peace in the midst of trouble is actually found in humble obedience and a pursuit of godliness. Look at verse 4. Tremble and do not sin. Ponder in your heart upon your bed and be still. We know that it's easy to fear those who may harm us, to fear the effects of slander, to fear the consequences of a wrong choice or decision, the outcome of sickness or what might or might not happen for our children. What if I lose my job or I don't get that job or I get overlooked or an endless list of things that may never come to pass? Fear, anxiety, they can be debilitating. David had much reason to fear but he shows us here the path to trust the Lord in the face of disturbance in the soul. In verse 4, he says, tremble and do not sin. Your translation might say, be angry and do not sin. But here in Psalm 4, the, the word itself simply means tremble or, or shake. And it can speak of the shaking of the earth. Or it can be speak of the shaking or trembling of people. And when talking about people, such trembling can accompany grief. It can accompany anger or fear. But the word doesn't tell us which one it is. And so we must look to the context to discern the reason for trembling. And so it's best then to translate the word simply as tremble or maybe be disturbed. Uh, the New Revised Standard Version says, which might also capture it well, says, when you are disturbed. And, and know that some disturbance or inner agitation in life is a natural reflex to when we're surrounded by danger. There are things that grate against what we know to be right or fair or safe. For example, we might say someone that, that someone has a healthy fear of snakes. Or healthy fear of heights, or maybe they're disturbed by scorpions or sharks. We are also rightly disturbed by sin, our own sin, and the sin of others. So how should we take Psalm 4-4? We want to be careful not to be maybe too dogmatic on this, but whatever the meaning, we need to understand it alongside David's command to not sin. Whatever it is, David feels it necessary to provide a warning right alongside of it. And do not sin. Whatever inner disturbance in the soul is being addressed, there is at that time a danger that our agitation will descend into sin. So beware when it's present. And we'll come back to this trembling, but look first at verse 4b. He says, Ponder in your heart upon your bed and be still. The word translated ponder is a word that simply means speak. And it's translated that way over 5,000 times in the Bible. And so we should understand this verse as saying, speak in your heart or speak to your heart upon your bed and be still. I mean, that idea is still captured in our English translation. But David's word choice is more forceful than the word ponder. This is not a command to muse in your own thoughts, listening to your own heart. No, David calls us to speak in our hearts, to speak to our hearts. Instruct your hearts how to feel. Speak to your heart what is true. Direct your heart how to think. This is shepherding your heart in the direction that it should go. This is heart shepherding. Let your mind instruct your heart and not the other way around. And our hearts are wayward. And they'll lead us astray if we follow them. And verse 4's instruction seems to be given for just that reason. When we are disturbed by our circumstances, perhaps by those who, are, who have sinned against us. It's right to be grieved over such sin. But there is a danger that that inward agitation 
will turn into sin in our own hearts. So what must we do? And David gives us two instructions. Speak to your heart and upon your bed and be still. David is telling us that when we're feeling like we're being provoked in our own souls, we are especially susceptible to sin. We must not let sin rob us of our joy and our peace in the Lord. So when agitated, don't respond in anger or fear. Instead, he calls us to work through this inward agitation so that we don't sin. And we do that by telling our hearts what to feel and what to do. We, we control our feelings in such a way that we're able to respond not in anger, not in fear, but in gentleness and self-control, a self-control that allows us to be silent and still, even amidst our agitation. So David tells us to take hold of joy and peace in the midst of distress by pursuing godly character. And the first way he tells us to do that is to not let our agitation descend into sin. Secondly, gain dominion over your agitation by directing your heart. David isn't calling his readers to, to be agitated. We don't need a command to be disturbed. David didn't need a command to be distressed. No, he actually is coming to the Lord because he already is distressed. We don't need to muster up this sort of agitation inside of us. We do that naturally. And it can quickly descend right into sin. So in our agitation, we must resolve to deal with it quickly, to put an end to it in our hearts. The one whose inward agitation is manifesting itself in outward trembling must deal with it, must control it and bring their heart and their body under control and be silent. So David says, be speak to your heart, be still in your bed. Go to your bed and deal with the agitation in your heart. Paul said, when referencing the Greek translation of this same verse, or at least alluding to it, in Ephesians 4, not to let the sun go down on your anger, or your, we could say your angry agitation, deal with it before going to sleep. The human heart is going to be agitated in this life, in a fallen world. We may get angry or fearful or feel extreme grief and Paul says in Ephesians 4, don't give the devil an opportunity. And he then tells us, if there's any lack of clarity in Ephesians 4.30, to put away all bitterness and anger. And whether Paul is speaking in Ephesians or David in Psalm 4, there is no room to hold on to anger or agitation towards another. Have you ever been sinned against like David? That's hard. Well, do you want to be able to hold on to joy and peace even when you're sinned against? Do you want to avoid that sin that will rob you of peace and joy? Then pursue godly character by not letting it descend into anger. Gain dominion over that agitation. And then third, worship Yahweh from the heart. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Well, unrighteous sacrifices were only ever external. They kept the outward form, but they didn't match what was going on in the heart. Psalm 51, which was also penned by David, said, David says, You're not pleased with burnt offerings, speaking to the Lord. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. God desired his people to, yes, follow, follow his plans for maintaining fellowship with him by following God's commands in the sacrificial system. But that obedience and worship were to be accompanied by genuine obedience from the heart as well. And so there's no room 
for holding on to agitation and anger in your heart or fear in your heart, at the same time believing that you can worship God from the heart. Whatever occupies your heart occupies your worship. You want joy and peace in the Lord? Worship him from the heart. And that requires you to deal with that which would take the Lord's place in your heart. That agitation, that brooding, that fear, bitterness. Don't fear man. Don't fear what he can do to you. Don't hold on to your anger. Deal with any lingering agitation and fear and anxiety by worshiping the Lord. Hebrews 13 gives us a New Testament perspective on thinking through what are sacrifices of righteousness? What might those look like in the church? We're not in David's time. We're, we're here in the church. What might a sacrifice of righteousness look like in the church? Well, Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. It's worship. And do not neglect doing good and sharing for which such sacrifices God is pleased. We see in this passage the worship of God and the service of others. These are modern day sacrifices that can, we can make today in which God is well pleased. Worshiping him from the heart doesn't hold on to agitation against those who sin against us. Instead, we must start with an attitude of forgiveness in the church and and service. When this is your perspective in the church, when sinned against to forgive, to serve others. And it's amazing to watch how the Lord works in your heart to help you put away bitterness and sinful agitation in your own heart as you set your heart to pour yourself out for the good of others, including those who have sinned against you. So are you in distress? Are you feeling pressed in from all sides? Maybe the sin of others is affecting you. Are you serving? Are your eyes on yourself or have you actually purposed to set your eyes outside of yourself and serve others? David could have held on to his anger against those who sinned against him, but instead, what did we see in his life? He's actually sought reconciliation with Saul. He sought reconciliation with his son Absalom. He continued to behave graciously towards them. He could have even taken joy in their deaths, but instead he was overcome with grief and love for those whom he had lost. He showed undeserved kindness to his enemies. He didn't hold on to anger in his heart, but instead he sought to please the Lord in righteous worship, which meant forgiving the offenses of others. We'd be wise not to underestimate the the devastating nature of continuing to cultivate anger and bitterness in our hearts towards others in the church. It will reflect your relationship with them and it will affect your relationship with the Lord, your worship of the Lord. Well, in further describing this pursuit of righteous character, David highlights our need to trust Yahweh. Verse 5b. Verse 5b says, and trust in Yahweh. This is David's solution to fear and anxiety. Don't trust in your own soul. Don't trust in your ability to right wrongs. But trust the one who has proved that he is trustworthy. Trust in him who is your righteousness, who cares for you, who desires your good, who has shown you imaginable and undeserved kindness. Trust Yahweh. He's trustworthy. Put your faith in him. And when you do, what sweet medicine that will be for a worried heart. Have you ever tried to worry when you were praising God? Instead of lying in your bed, thinking about your problems, express your trust in Yahweh to him in prayer and actually worship him. Praise him. 
Do you, do you lie in bed unable to stop worrying about tomorrow? Be still, be quiet, and offer up a prayer of trust in the Lord. Pray to him, praise him. He, David, didn't do this on his own. He didn't control his disturbed heart on his own. It started with a prayer of trust and dependence on the Lord, a cry for help. When we said David shows us three necessary pursuits in the fight for joy and peace in times of distress, we are to cast ourselves upon God and his character. We are to pursue godly character. And third, we are to look to God's good. First, by looking to God's promises in dark times. Read verse 6. Many are saying, who will show us good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Yahweh. Doubters mock God's ability to show goodness to his people. Whatever the identity of the many here, they've lost their faith and their patience with waiting for God any longer. They look out on the world and they doubt God's goodness. But the response of God's people, the response of David here is altogether different than the world's response, different than the many's response. God's people to respond to such mocking by looking to God for his light to shine in their dark circumstances. Verse 6, lift up the light of your face upon us. Things might seem dark and bleak, but this prayer to the Lord calls the people back to Numbers 6. 24 and 26, where Yahweh blesses the people of Israel. Listen to Numbers 6, 24 to 26. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh will lift up his face on you and give you peace. God's enemies doubt God's goodness, but God's people remember that God keeps his people God gives light to those in darkness. He showers grace upon the undeserving. He looks with favor on his people and he offers peace. David calls to mind this familiar verse from the Pentateuch that he must have been meditating on. And it, and it makes his way into his, prepare, into his prayer, reminding the people that God has indeed shown his people good. And as they pray to, as he prays to God to, to bring light, to lift up his face, it's a reminder that this present darkness will not last forever for his godly ones. So look to God to bring light into your darkness, into your dark circumstances, into your trials, into your distress. It may not come quickly, but it will come if you are in Christ, trouble will not follow you beyond this life. If you're in Christ, trouble will never follow you beyond this life. Is that comforting? It should be. Our life after this one is much longer. And there will be no trouble there. The darkness will end. Next, David further recounts that the good that God has shown Looking to God's good, we are to look to God's promises in dark times and next, rightly appraise godly joy. Verse 7, look at verse 7 with me. David says, you have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. And these last two verses are where the whole psalm has been heading towards. Grain and new wine abound at the harvest in David's day. For us, we can have fresh fruit every day of the year just by going to the grocery store. If it can't be grown in our part of the world at a certain time of the year, we can usually get it shipped from other parts of the country or other parts of the world where it can grow. Well, this wasn't the case for David. For them, they could eat fresh fruit only when it was in season and only what was local, only at the harvest time. 
Every other time, they had to eat food that had been preserved by salt or dried. But think of that wonderful time of the year when they could eat fresh fruit and, and fresh grain and wine. If you were in that time, it doesn't get better than that. That's when you feast. But David says, I have more gladness, more joy in my heart than they have. David makes this comparison between his joy and the joy of the world to silence the lie that God has shown no good to his people. The people question, who can show us good, but God has. And he has shown us greater good than all the world's joys and pleasures. And they won't end. So David is in distress. His enemies are slandering him. But David says, it doesn't matter because I have the fountain of joy that's not dependent upon circumstances. But it's dependent upon God who gives me joy. He gives me joy even in the dark times. I don't need the pleasures of the harvest to have joy. I don't need everything to go well with me to have joy. I just need God who gives me joy and gladness in my heart. Well, lastly, look to God's good by resting in God's security. Verse 8, rest in God's security. In verse 8, we see another God-given blessing, sleep. Maybe some amens out there that are silent. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Yahweh, make me to abide in safety. If you remember David's life, he was constantly on the run. Every time he laid down his head, he put his life in danger. Would he wake up? Would, he be, would his enemies come upon him in the night, in a cave, in a field? But David says, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. And this is the punchline. How do you find joy and peace in times of intense pressure all around you? You find it in trusting the Lord and resting in God's security. Despite his troubles, David finds his rest in God, his security in God. And, and these, these very verses hint at danger. Uh, David still seems to point to the danger that could still come at night. Yet he goes to sleep trusting that his security lies in God. And that type of rest can only be found in God. When there potentially are armies around you, yet to rest in sleep. Could David be certain that he was free from danger while he slept? No. But he could be certain that nothing could touch him if the Lord didn't allow it. His future as ordained by God, was safe. Whatever God had predetermined could happen, would happen. Nothing could alter God's plan. So in that sense, he was safe. He was safe in the hands, in the plan of the one who was perfectly wise, perfectly sovereign, and perfectly good. And he could trust himself, and trust himself to him. In David's darkness, he looked to God for light. He knew his darkness would one day end and in his sorrow, David discovered the gift of gladness. He discovered the gift of joy, not in his circumstances, but in the Lord. In the time of battle and pressure, he experienced peace. God didn't change David's circumstances the second he prayed. But in Psalm 4, we got to see that he changed David. David from a man who was distressed to a man who trusted in the Lord. So as what sort of impact does Psalm four have in our own lives? Some just questions for you as we re reflect on this passage. What, what are you currently going through that is unexpected, unwanted, causing hardship? Are you, are, are you struggling to find joy in that circumstance? You're not alone. Maybe God's peace seems elusive. 
Well, then do as David did. Remind yourself about the attributes of God. Speak these truths to your heart. What you know to be true and believe them. True faith reasons from God's righteousness, from his past kindness that he showed to us, his grace that he's poured out upon us. It reasons from the brevity, the shortness of this present distress. It's like this, any trial we're going through is only temporary. Trouble will never chase us to the next life if we're in Christ. True faith reasons from God's mercy, his sovereignty, and his providence. Secondly, consider the most difficult times that you've endured. Times when the pressure just seemed overwhelming. What level of importance did your own pursuit of godly character occupy in your mind at that time? When times are difficult, what happens to your normal pursuit of Christian disciplines? You're reading God's word, praying to God, worshiping God, serving others. Laboring to forgive others. Oh, in difficult times, it's so easy for us to turn inward to ourself. To consider what, is it fair what I'm going through? No, turn to look outward and upward. Pursue godly character. Pursue that which is pleasing to the Lord. Especially when it's most difficult. This is going to actually help you maintain a right perspective. And it's actually going to help you hold on to joy, true joy and peace in the Lord. One more. What brings you happiness? In other words, what is your wine and grain? And that when they abound, you're happy. Literally or figuratively. How do you, how do you react when they're taken away? Is your joy in the giver of these gifts or in the gifts themselves? How can you take practical steps to actually appreciate these good gifts as gifts of the one who gave them and not enjoy them as an end in themselves? If we are giving and enjoying and setting all our affections on the gift itself, when those are taken away, we will find our souls distressed. But the one who gives those gifts can never be taken away. And then lastly, in your distress, in your agitation, in times of intense pressure, do you see the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit? Do you see love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control in the most difficult of times in your life? Where is fruit lacking? If you don't see that, repent. If you don't know Christ, then these things are not possible. You can't muster up these things in yourself. But these are the things that the Lord accomplishes in the life of each believer when they turn to and entrust themselves to Jesus Christ alone for their, as their only hope of forgiveness and salvation. So if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd love to talk to you afterwards about what it means to put your hope and trust in the Lord. This life is hard and it's full of sin, sin around us. We have a sin-cursed world and sin inside of us. And that makes life challenging. But more than anything, it puts us at odds with a holy God. But there is hope. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Do you Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the example of David. We, we thank you that we can see a man who was distressed. And yet you changed you changed not because of his abilities, not because of his willpower, but because of you working in him as he came to you, depended upon you. Lord, we, we ask you to help us. Lord, we find ourselves in ver- a variety of dark times at work, in our homes. People sin against us. We s- incur the consequences of our own sin. 
And Lord, our hearts might be, our hearts might be troubled. And we find when that's the case, sin is often lurking at the door. Lord, we ask that you would preserve us, keep us from sin. Help us to worship you rightly from the heart. Help us to, by your grace, to put aside anger and bitterness and wrath and fear from our hearts and actually put on love and joy and peace and patience. As we turn to you, help us where our faith is weak to trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen.